So what if I told you that you are guaranteed to get cancer at some point in your life? Well, is it true that every male gets prostate cancer? Most, in other words, uh, every on their man, deathbed, every man have, will die with prostate cancer, and some will die from it. You, it. you, and I have prostate cancer right now. So, cancer is this big, scary boogeyman that everyone is terrified of encountering, especially in this modern, unnatural environment, rife with a profusion of toxins that are imploring our cells to mutate. And so, in this video, I want to discuss how my conceptualization of the cancer phenomenon has changed over the years, what I think is and is not putting me at risk, how I personally protect myself from cancer currently, and what I plan to do in the future as I grow older. One approach being the implementation of selective androgen receptor modulators. And yes, despite the mainstream's demonization of SARMs, there is sufficient research supporting them as anti-cancer agents, specifically when it comes to the most common type of cancer in man. So over the past few years, I stopped conceptualizing cancer as some binary disease you either have or don't have. Like Dr. Atia said, every man will die with prostate cancer, but only some will die from it. Especially as we grow older, we all have cancerous cells within our bodies. The issue only arises when the cancer cells proliferate faster than our immune system can annihilate the cells. In fact, it's theorized, definitely not proven, but it's an interesting theory proposed by many scientists that cancer actually has some sort of functional evolutionary utility. One being that cancer is a buffer for toxins. In this theory, cancer cells may play a role in sequestering or concentrating toxins, acting as some sort of biological sponge. So cells that accumulate DNA damage from carcinogens, radiation, and environmental toxins could turn cancerous. The body might use the cancerous growths as a way to isolate and localize the damage, keeping it from spreading to healthy cells. And you know, when the human physiology is optimized, the immune system targets and destroys these cancer cells before they pathologize. But of course, when it's not optimized, this process can obviously become dysfunctional. So I no longer view cancer as a disease that I have a probability of getting, but rather a natural phenomenon that will inevitably take place and one that deserves proper attention to keep balanced and under control. This is why it's fairly reductive when people attempt to find the answer to the question, do growth factors like IGF-1 and growth hormone, which are increased by MK677, for example, cause cancer or not? There's a reason why the research is so ambivalent. Some literature supports while other literature invalidates these growth factors as cancer causing. Net cancer proliferation is the result of the interplay among innumerable physiological processes and environmental factors. It's a balancing act. Many things prevent cancer in low quantities while expediting cancer at higher quantities. So when you think of antioxidants, for example, you probably immediately think beneficial and anti-cancer. At high doses, however, some studies suggest that excessive antioxidant intake can have the opposite effect. Instead of merely neutralizing free radicals, high doses of antioxidants may suppress normal cellular signaling pathways that use oxidative stress as part of immune surveillance to detect and destroy cancer cells. And this is why a primary principle in the Natty Plus protocol is balance. So especially in this unnatural modern environment that suppresses many of our beneficial hormones, I like taking testosterone boosters like black ox and enclomiphene to boost my testosterone. I like taking MK677 to boost my growth hormone. The enhancement of these hormones is therapeutic at sensible degrees, but of course, excessive production of these hormones can be deleterious. In fact, if it weren't for my anti-proliferative protocols, I'd be somewhat concerned about increasing so many growth factors in my brain with my nootropic stack. But I remain relatively stress-free because I've designed my lifestyle in the vital theme of balance. Do I strenuously attempt to avoid all toxins at all costs? No. Do I eat relatively healthy and avoid processed sugar 90% of the time? Yes. Do I make sure every morsel I ingest is an organic whole food? No. I accept that in this modern environment, I will be exposed to a certain degree of toxins unless I decide to move out into the wilderness and live off the land, which I don't plan on doing anytime soon. You know, sometimes we can stress ourselves out so much by being so meticulously health conscious. And ironically, that consistent stress can chronically elevate our cortisol levels and be counterproductive. So when it comes to cancer, I have just three main principles. So avoid the obvious and most potent carcinogens. So for example, don't smoke cigarettes. 
Uh, do your best to optimize your holistic well-being. That's where the Natty Plus protocol and my other biohacking endeavors come into play. You know, every physiological and psychological process is interconnected, so improving one area of your health benefits all other areas to a degree and sufficiently enhance autophagy. So autophagy is a natural process in which our cells break down and recycle their own components, like damaged organelles and proteins to maintain cellular health and homeostasis. So autophagy helps eliminate damaged mitochondria and proteins that could otherwise lead to cellular stress and mutations. So by maintaining cellular integrity, autophagy prevents the accumulation of mutations that might lead to cancer. So fasting is my primary practice to enhance autophagy. Every day, I at least practice the standard intermittent fasting protocol with a six to eight hour eating window. And then at least twice per week, I do 20 to 24 hour fasts. And then every couple months or so, I'll do an extended fast for a little longer than that. So fasting is actually anti-cancer through more mechanisms than simply autophagy though. So it enhances insulin sensitivity, reduces inflammation, et cetera. So it's my staple anti-cancer protocol. And then as far as my supplementation goes, most of, if not all my health focused supplements are going to be anti-cancer to a degree at proper dosages. So remember if it's improving some aspect of your health, then it should mitigate the propensity for cancer proliferation to an extent. So anything from turmeric, you know, to BPC-157 has research supporting its beneficial effects in relation to cancer. Obviously, slin pills and or metformin have utility in this regard as well, since they significantly reduce the propensity for insulin resistance, which is implicated in essentially every health pathology, including cancer. But my favorite anti-proliferative supplement is Syrian rue, Paganum harmala. So I've come to the soft conclusion based on the research that this may be the most potent singular anti-cancer supplement that I currently take. So it does influence autophagy quite significantly, and it does seem to be beneficial in a myriad of physiological processes. It also acts as an MAOI, which gives me a mood boost. And even the mental boosts are relevant in this discussion because of the improved stress response elicited by more favorable emotional states. And so finally, SARMs. So at the moment, I don't have a consistent SARMs dosing regimen. The last SARMs cycle that I ran was in preparation for an appearance at the Mr. Olympia Expo last year and served as a lab work experiment for this channel. And at this point in my life, I'm content with my physique. The reason I take MK677 and Enclomiphene and even something like Turkestrone, for example, has far less to do with enhancing my physique and much more to do with optimizing my holistic health and well-being via the other benefits that these supplements provide. And I used to mostly view SARMs as having pure bodybuilding utility, so they haven't been that compelling to take, but the more research I do, the more inclined I am to begin a regimented SARMs protocol, especially as I grow older. And the primary reason being cancer prevention specifically prostate cancer progression, because as you heard Dr. Atiyah say, every man gets prostate cancer to an extent as they grow old. And if you're new to this channel, you're probably shocked to hear me say this because you've been inculcated with the idea from the mainstream that SARMs are extremely dangerous. But again, this is an epitomization of the black and white thinking that plagues the health and fitness community. The therapeutic utility of SARMs depends on the dosage. And of course they have the potential to be abused, but they were specifically designed to optimize overall health. And at sensible dosages, dosages far less than your typical SARMs goblin takes, there's a bounty of literature that supports this, specifically in the case of prostate cancer. There's also some research for breast cancer as well, although that's of less interest to me personally. And this makes sense. We know that prostate cancer to a degree is driven by androgenic activity, DHT being the primary culprit. And even testosterone has the potential to expedite prostate cancer proliferation. And SARMs were specifically designed to exert less androgenic effects than your typical androgens. So SARMs will compete with your natural androgens, testosterone and DHT. They bind to the androgen receptors in the prostate, blocking some of the testosterone and DHT. So now you have the SARM where the testosterone or DHT would usually be. And because the SARM is less androgenic, it's less damaging to the prostate. So this is why the idea of running intermittent low dose SARM cycles is appealing to me. Now to optimize this approach, I would use specific SARMs that have the best side effect profile, you know, the least androgenic ones, the ones with the lowest propensity to induce liver toxicity, because there's no point in just substituting one pathology for another. So 
You guys know my favorite SARM is AC262 because of how well I and many other people tolerate it. I have not heard of any cases of liver toxicity as opposed to something like RAD140, which has been implicated in many cases of liver toxicity. Now, this would be an interesting series of experiments to do in the future. I could take different SARMs and get my prostate-specific antigen levels tested, you know, to gain conclusive evidence in reference to SARM's effects on the prostate. I would probably need more rigorous prostate health tests, though, but this is an experiment that's intriguing to me. I've been thinking about doing it for a while, and I would like to make it happen, but Anyway, that's about it for this video. I hope you gained some insights into the whole cancer phenomenon and hopefully, you know, they lead you to modifying your lifestyle in a positive way. So like always, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I read all of them and I try to respond to as many as I can. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.